semester uh, 2020 lecture series. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, let me uh, remind all of us uh, why we have these lectures. Uh, the topic of the semester lecture has been the breadth of architecture practice and work. And the intention for these talks has been to raise awareness and invite discussion about the multiple and different ways in which we could practice or think about architecture. And the four speakers, the three previous to Suchi Redis tonight uh, and, and Suchi tonight, um, allow us to explore an array of options as we have uh, and will see. For instance, Marshall Brown started a semester challenging us to think of architectural design as an envisioning tool, he called it uh, fiction, uh, to lead society uh, and culture into different uh, potential tomorrows. Uh, then we had John Marks from Form 4 uh, in architecture in San Francisco, who demonstrated how successful corporate practices could still retain and in fact advance a poetic and artistic vision of architecture. Two weeks ago, uh, we received a Finland-based architect and professor, Jenny Reuter, uh, who shared with us uh, her international recognized firm uh, inspiring work in the third world. Really remarkable work we saw. And tonight we have architect Suchi Reddy, uh, who leads a highly interdisciplinary, multi-scale uh, and award-winning design firm in New York City, who I will introduce in a minute. Through these four lectures, architecture has been revealed, or will be revealed as an open-ended discipline that allows graduates all type of paths and opportunities to develop themselves, pursue an ideal faith, help the world and fellow human beings, and you imagine what else. The hope is that these lectures afford all of us uh, the capacity to think architecture beyond what we, we think and know. Before I introduce uh, our speaker, uh, a few a few notes just to, to know where we're at. First, I'd like to recognize the Walton family uh, without whom we couldn't uh, run these uh, lectures because of their financial and moral support. So thank you, the Walton family. Also I want to thank uh, Kate Sullivan as I always do for her uh, support. Uh, these things take time. We were on Saturday working and she never think it twice. She always support us. So thank you, Kate. Uh, also, all those professionals in the audience that want to get AIA continuing education credits, please send me uh, your name and your AIA number to the email. I will type in the, uh, the chat room and I will take care of uh, getting you the credits. So please do that. We'll be recording, in fact, we are recording already um, tonight's lecture. So if for some reason you don't want to have your face uh, <laughs> show, um, Please discontinue your, your video. Um, this, uh, this video will only be available to uh, pe uh, people in the community, so it won't be broadcast worldwide, but it still will be available for the, for the CUA community. And uh, yeah. Um, uh, regarding tonight, uh, we're going to have a QA like we have done before. Professor Douglas Palladino, who you see there, will also host that uh, please don't wait until the very last minute to send your questions. So that way you're gonna make Douglas life very miserable. So uh, please submit your question beforehand if you can. So he could arrange that and students question have priority as you have seen in the past. Thank you, uh, Douglas, for your great work on that. Uh, also, um, um, there's gonna be something different tonight. We'll invite everybody, and Douglas will talk a little bit more about this as, as he takes over the Q&A at the end. Uh, we call it a post-lecture uh, discussion. This is organized by AIA-S, and uh, I'll post after we start a, a link in Miro where you could go and select a room where you could meet other students and some faculty and talk about uh, the lecture or whatever else you want to talk about. This is a, a chance for us as a community, as a school, to how we usually do when we have a lecture in Miller. We just go, you know, grab something to eat and, and a glass of wine and talk. So hopefully you can join AIS and some of the faculty there afterwards. And again, we'll, we'll post uh, a link for you to do that. So without more delay, let me introduce our speaker, Suchi Reddy, who we are very excited to have uh, tonight. And we appreciate your 
joining us tonight. My pleasure. A leader in today's global design culture, ready-made architecture and design was founded by Suchi Ready in 2002. The first practice spans the fields of architecture, design, installation, art, and sculpture. Its diverse portfolio of projects includes public installations, adaptive reuse of historical buildings, large-scale commercial spaces, and residential projects, from single-family homes to micro-apartments and prefab architecture. Based in New York City, ready-made design ethos is informed by neuroaesthetics, that is the study of how the brain responds to the design of our surroundings, from art and objects to the built environment. Ready's strong belief and that good design calibrated carefully to the human positively influences well-being, creativity, and productivity, and informs the firm's range of projects, uh, informs the, the firm's uh, range of projects from conception to details. More recently, neuroaesthetic design principles were central in a collaboration installation Google with Google, the International Arts uh, and Mind Lab at John Hopkins University and MUTO that was called, quote, a space for being, end of quote. Upcoming projects include a sensory healing room designed to improve recovery times for patients with disorders of consciousness and a flagship retail space exploring the intersection between technology and humans. Suchi Reddy is a member of the Van Allen Institute Leadership Council and sits on the board of the Design Trust for Public Space and Storefront for Art and Architecture. She was appointed to the Plain Distinguished Professor at the University of Illinois School of Architecture at uh, Urbana-Champaign for the fall 2019 semester. Suchi has represented, uh, has presented and lectured on the firm's work at numerous venues, including the Sark Institute for the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture in 2008 conference, uh, also at the University of Illinois and the University of Wisconsin. Today's lecture by uh, Suchi uh, Reddy is called uh, Borderless. Let's welcome uh, Suchi to our virtual podium. Thank you so much, Julio. Um, that was an incredible introduction. Really doesn't leave that much for me to say other than show you pictures, which is pretty fabulous. Um, uh, but uh, thank you all for being here uh, at the end of your uh, your day and a special thanks really to Professor Bimides for inviting me to be part of this lecture series. Um, I'm hoping that what I'll share with you today you'll find useful and I'm really looking forward to your questions because um, I feel that that's perhaps the most important place where we uh, learn from each other and um, um, it will be, it's always an honor to be able to present the work. So um, I will get started uh, shortly. Um, what I'm here to talk about today is really a, a concept uh, that has underlined uh, my creative process. And it's this idea of the concept of borderlessness. And in times of um, increasing and entrenched uh, political turmoil, cultural turmoil, I feel that it is particularly us as architects who are well suited to actually blur boundaries and stretch, um, uh, stretch borders to really explore what I think is a limited, liminal space in our collective thought process. And by doing that, I think um, we can really posit some very um, interesting solutions for a society that are interdisciplinary that can help um, propag propagate the poetic potential of our work, which um, really and truly is the basis of my interest. Um, as Julio mentioned, uh, this idea that form follows feeling has been something that has informed my practice always. And as I developed as an architect and into my practice, um, about uh, over a decade ago, I got really interested in this field called neuroaesthetics which looks at neuroscience and architecture and really how um, our spaces and our aesthetic experiences affect us, which of course for us is a really important confluence um, to consider in our work going forward. So I hope you will find it interesting. Um, so the, the practice really does span a lot of different kinds of um, projects. Uh, my rule is really nice people and nice projects, as I always say. So that could mean anything. It could mean something very small and it could mean something very big and anything in between. Um, so with that, I'm going to try and um, share my screen and get going. One second. Here we are. 
Okay. Can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. Great. Yes. Um, yes. So uh, I just wanted to start. I always like to start with this slide. With this slide, this is um, a still from a film called Suspiria, which I love. Um, by uh, Luca Guaranino, and for me, it represents really what I try to do in architecture, which I always find to be this kind of place of entry into worlds that perhaps we haven't discovered yet. Um, so that said, uh, what I'd like to do is take you through uh, the project that Julio mentioned, which is called A Space for Being, um, that debuted in Milan um, last year in April. And this project was conceived as um, a vehicle to um, explain to the general public the importance of design and really through the lens of neuroaesthetics so that we could design three different spaces. Um, they would be visitors would be allowed to experience these spaces and we would let them see their bodily reactions to this space back to them really to illustrate the fact that space matters design matters and that the decisions we make around these things have um, impact far beyond just the visual or the experiential. Um, just one second. There we go. So this um, project starts as a collection of three rooms. Now this was, they spanned about 7,000 square, um, 7, square feet. Uh, we built it in about six days, which is no mean feat. Um, but this project was conceived in collaboration with Google and uh, also the International Arts and Mind Lab at Johns Hopkins, um, with whom I've done uh, a little bit of work looking at this intersection of both science and architecture. And um, the idea was that Google would design a band, which they did, as you can see in this slide, specifically to measure um, bodily metrics. And um, once visitors who uh, had to agree, if, uh, first and foremost, to let leave, leave their phones behind and spend 10 minutes in each room without speaking to uh, anyone else and just allow themselves to experience the space, um, and then uh, come out at the end and have their reactions read. So the first space that you enter actually is an anechoic chamber, um, which uh, sort of acts as a little bit of a, a palate cleanser. Sorry, my uh, arrow seems to be giving me other things than my next slide. One second, there we go. Um, so the first room um, was uh, a very kind of an earthy space that um, I, my inspiration was uh, essentially early caves. So the walls were um, made of earth and mud and wood and uh, the uh, tapestry that you see in the back is actually uh, dyed with the dyes from flowers. It's by Claudia Youngstra, who's an incredible um, artist. And um, all of the materials were real, were tactile. Um, I curated uh, the activities in this space as well. So in this space there were books about making, about reading, about poetry, etc. And there were also we had partners um, who created um, scent and um, sound for the spaces and the lighting was very important. Um, this is actually one of my favorite slides. This is an 80 year old cactus I brought in. Um, he was like this revered gentleman that I that I put in the room because um, I loved his presence. Um, but the idea was to create this first space that was very, very tactile. And the second space, um, this sketch, uh, explains. So you go through another interstitial chamber, which is anechoic, and you get into something that's completely different than where you just were. Um, and we did this again by manipulating different architectural elements, as you can see, from light to color to scale to proportion. But the function of the rooms was always the same because we had to maintain some kind of a control. Um, and so this space um, I curated actually with a whole bunch of pop-up books, which are also a huge favorite of mine and I think of most architects. Um, and we, uh, so this was a much more playful space and the sound and smell in here were very different. Um, excuse me, next one, there we go. Um, I'll just take you through some things. Um, and the things that are unexpected in this space, and that was the idea, was to really move things up, to make them colorful, to change up what you were thinking. The third room is what we called um, the space where we wanted things to be sublime. So the lighting came from above. Um, I had commissioned uh, some, uh, some artworks that were made of scorched wood, as you can see in the right of this slide, which also had their own smell and their own texture. The walls were made of paper and you could really touch and see and feel. And this is the only room where I introduced plants. 
um, and uh, really emphasize this kind of more serene and sublime lighting that came from above. Um, when you exited, this was um, your exit space, and you would go here, you would place your band here, and it would be red. So I'm going to be quiet while you see what happens on the screen. So what we wanted to show people in this case was really um, that uh, you are always reacting to your space in so many ways, much more than just uh, the function. And so when you came out of it, you were left with an artifact that was also a poetic artifact that looked like a, a beautiful watercolor. And um, we, you came outside through an informational space that also taught you a little bit more in case you wanted to delve a little bit deeper into um, the science behind what we were trying to do. So as an interdisciplinary approach that really helped us propagate um, a poetic approach to making space, this was actually an amazing project um, because it allowed me to collaborate with technology, with science, with space, um, and you know all of the other um, things that we do normally as architects, such as structure and uh, building things and making them on time and on budget and all of these other issues. Um, so essentially, um, this was a space where you would come out at the end and you would um, uh, get to learn more or be able to talk to people. We also had panels in this space. So I think what follows next is a short video which tells you kind of a fuller story. I will remain silent through that one. And this is actually the artifact that you take away with you. And this is what it looked like when we pulled them all together. So part of the, um, um, the, the rules of this project, the underlying rule was that we didn't keep anyone's data. Everything was deleted. So really what was left was the physical artifact of their experience. Um, here we go. The way this project is unusual is that we are actually pursuing a principle. I really believe that form follows feeling, and feeling is really what space and architecture are about. Space actually affects people. Design matters. It's why we spend the time making the decisions we do. Those things that we as designers intuit, neuroscience is now proving have an effect. Google created an exhibition that is showing design's impact on our biology. The way that I explain neuroaesthetics is really simple. It's basically how your brain changes on the arts. When you have a heightened aesthetic experience, like a piece of music, a sunrise, things that really elevate your everyday experiences, they change you. They change your biology, they change your mood, they change your emotion. I called Suchi Reddy and I said, taking the neuroaesthetic principles, could you create three different rooms that would evoke different responses? The goal is to see how people resonate with space and to really find out whether what they think they resonate with is what their body is actually resonating with. We respond to the aesthetics of our environments, whether we realize it or not. The band can demonstrate with data from the sensors that actually is happening. Heart activity, respiratory activity, skin temperature, skin conductance. We figure out from the data which room is the one that feels the calmest or the most at ease for people. Where 
does your physiology feel most peaceful? I think it's what people are searching for. The space between the notes, the place where they can come and just be. The interiors where we work and where we live have a deep impact on our well-being. We always know that and believed in it, but we haven't been able to quantify it and prove it. You enter a space and it's like, I, I like it, but why? This is about data used as a mirror back to yourself. Data is just a bunch of numbers, and we wanted to make it artistic in its expression. It can be really hard to put an aesthetic experience into words. But suddenly, by combining science and technology, we get a new language. We select the room, too, as the room that we the most common. Maybe a watercolor can sell more than a thousand words. Technology has the ability to help you know yourself better. The problems of the future are only going to become more complicated. Solutions have to happen in this collaboration of technology, the arts, and science. Um, so with that, uh, I'll take you to a, a different kind of project, one that is, um, uh, I guess, pretty much um, standard, uh, but in no means um, uh, it are the lessons of sort of the previous project ignored in this one. So um, here I will start with taking you through a project that we did in Venice, California. And these ideas of human centric design, the role of architecture in really being a generator of well being for people is something that um, I believe very strongly in. And so in the design of this building, um, it was very important to me, again, to rely on a lot of the similar elements that you saw in the previous one, which would be texture, exposure to the elements. This, in this case, um, we wanted to work with a pool that was sort of the, the, the driving force of a very, very narrow lot that then throws its reflections everywhere so that it allows this beautiful um, exploration of light within the space that could um, bleed from inside uh, to outside. So um, vegetation also played a really, really important part. This is actually quite an urban site and there were quite a few things that needed to be shielded for a sense of privacy, also for a sense of safety. And um, we worked very closely with an amazing landscape designer um, to actually make this possible and to expand actually the visual um, limits because uh, coming from New York, I understand what narrow lots are, but Californians quite, don't quite get that. And so it was sort of interesting to see how lessons from one region of the country also play into another that has a completely different kind of um, uh, uh, conditions, completely different kinds of conditions. So again, here you will see there's a lot of things about texture that were very carefully considered here from the paving to the texture of the planting and really looking at scales of elements of different uh, kinds that we could introduce um, of really creating visual focus, often borrowing it from the neighbor, as you can see from this palm tree that um, we kind of worked around so that it's a strategic uh, point of focus also, which also allows you um, to, um, when you stretch to a distance in a narrow space, it also makes your, uh, your brain and your um, uh, visual faculties operate a little differently so and a little bit more easily so um, to do things like that to use spaces under stairs to create um, zen rock gardens um, and uh, really give them a space where they could um, certainly in this case be inside and outside and um, really feel the elements um, as much as possible um, so i will using natural elements everywhere where, where we could and um, bringing us uh, to an, the next project, this one also in California, but of a different kind uh, of typology where it's, um, this is a, a prefab house. Um, but again, here, the idea of light um, really ruled uh, light and texture. So this, this image I always start with because here you can see basically what this house is about. It's about this sense of kind of, openness and looking outside, but also the difference in texture that you see between the floor and the light and the shadows that it makes creates this kind of um, subliminal um, poetry that you really feel when you're in the space because you feel like you're in light and air all the time. Um, so this um, was a very interesting kind of a hybrid project. Um, again, here you will see my fixation on finding um, a visual focus in, in the neighborhood, again, in a different palm tree, um, but also opening up to 
lots of different kinds of views, really playing with light and shadow, um, very, um, uh, I would say honestly, in this case, and very earnestly as well, this was really something that was very important in both of these projects um, for us to work with. So you can see the, the passing of time um, through the house um, and through the elements of it that made it uh, incredibly important for the client um, who is a long time long term client of mine so we're able to have uh, a very open discussion about design and very fluid um, back and forth uh, which without which of course it's up here to say thank you to those clients of mine that really support me in my uh, search for the poetic um, even if i'm doing it for them um, it's telling me my internet connection is unstable for any reason. So if you do have any issues with seeing my screen, please let me know. Um, so this house, actually, one of the most interesting things about this house was also the fact that we worked with uh, a firm that does mostly prefab architecture and um, really looked at making it a hybrid between a custom house and a prefab house that was built into a very steeply sloping site um, and therefore necessitated a mix of both kinds of uh, techniques of building. Um, so actually it went too fast. And um, so what you see in front is a stair tower that was actually a custom built element, but the rest of the house is a series of eight modules um, that get assembled together. Um, so I will take you next um, to a project of a completely different scale. Um, this was a, a competition that we were shortlisted for, um, for a cause that I really, really, really believe in and um, I'm very hopeful that this will get built one day, even though we didn't win, um, but I do think it's extremely important. Um, it was meant to be an aggregator for not-for-profits around uh, the girls and women's rights movement. And um, it was, the site was actually, um, if you can see my mouse, this is, a, this was a former, um, medium or low security prison for women. Um, and after Hurricane Sandy, this was decommissioned actually um, because of flooding. And uh, the, the brief was to generate a, a place for not-for-profits that were working with the girls and women's rights movements to gather, to have a space for important places for women to speak um, when they came uh, into the city, uh, a place for all of us to congregate. And because the building was landmarked, um, the adjoining tower had to touch it very carefully uh, so that it was not visible from the street as encroaching on this building. Um, so it was also very interesting uh, where it's placed. It's an extremely prominent location on the West Side Highway next to buildings by Frank Gehry and Jean Nouvel. Um, so our uh, solution and idea here, again, you will see this is about form follows feeling where I wanted to express um, the strength and femininity of a building uh, using a material um, called ductile, which is a very, very high strength concrete that can span large distances, even at thicknesses of a few inches, and uh, to incorporate that with light so that we could bring in this kind of free flowing, um, inviting, welcoming uh, space um, that actually was attached to a place that hadn't been that at all. And one of the most interesting things about this project is that we started actually by listening to focus groups of uh, women who had uh, served, who had lived in this prison, um, and it, it just had so much poetic potential. Um, unfortunately, it is not going ahead at the moment, but I'm really hoping that they will build this uh, at some point. Um, this is a view of the building at nighttime. Um, the idea here was to really create a, a literal beacon in the landscape that would announce this very important uh, program for this building. Um, and this is actually where you see those tendrils of the tower as they encompass the older building, creating an auditorium space um, that could be where one would gather to hear lectures or people of note as they come to address the local community. Um, I'll take you to a different scale now, back to a house, but a different kind of house. Um, this one is in upstate New York. 
And um, again, you will see here um, the idea of nestling in nature, of really um, taking into account what views are, how they, how to cite a building. In this project, we were um, honored to collaborate with the artist and activist um, Ai Weiwei on this project. Um, our client brought us together and um, asked if we could work with them. And of course we said yes. And um, it's an amazing, amazing property of like rolling uh, land, but it's a very, very simple building that's a hexagon in shape, um, which attaches to the existing building, which is a hexagon in plan. So what we did is take the hexagon, extrude it in section, extend it and attach it to the building, which is a very simple move. Um, but I will say um, I was very impressed with it and um, very happy to be able to work with our way to um, make this building a reality. Um, on a very um, uh, humble budget, shall I say, um, I mean, the way in which it's nestled into the landscape. So this was really important again, and you'll see this kind of uh, fixation through the work um, is really of where one puts one's focus. And um, there were some magnificent trees that I felt needed to be celebrated um, in relationship to the siting of the building. And so we were very careful to place them, uh, to place the building so that we could take advantage of these views. Um, the next project is um, one of my favorites. And this is a large scale uh, public installation that um, we did in Prospect Park in Brooklyn. Um, if any of you know it, it is uh, the other really large park um, that Olmsted and Vox designed in New York City. And it's an amazing park. It's incredibly different from Central Park in the sense that it's, it's a sense of these kinds of magical spaces that come together and, and you sort of open up to these vistas of, of wonder, um, which is a very different feeling than you have in Central Park. So this was very inspiring to me because um, to be able to work in this kind of a space and really understand how you create these senses of wonder, even in landscape, you know, really made me kind of understand and appreciate uh, the genius of Olmsted. Um, so we were given uh, a site that was called, uh, it used to be called the Rose Garden, but what it was is a series of defunct pools. Um, and uh, what we were charged with doing is designing um, an installation that would commemorate the 150th anniversary of the park. And um, the organizers of the event um, who brought us on as designers um, wanted to generate an installation that the community could express their feelings of the park about. So I went back to um, an old childhood fascination of mine, which was um, actually pinwheels because this sense of wonder that the park created was something that I wanted to really work with and emphasize. And um, the pinwheel is this object that I feel everyone responds to with a sense of wonder and a, and a smile, regardless of age. And um, it seemed to be the perfect vehicle because what we ended up doing is actually using um, the paper of the pinwheel as the place where people could express um, their feelings and their views. Um, so to create an emotional installation that um, also reflected nature and the forces of nature in um, as you experienced it. So um, to give you a little bit of history, this is what it used to look like when it was originally designed and it was, um, you know, very well used, but fell into disrepair. And so what we did is really use those empty pools um, as uh, galleries, as theaters. And we created um, sort of um, an undulating uh, series of pinwheels of different heights while respecting the natural paths that had already been carved out through the space as they cut through the installation. So what you do is you walk through this installation, but you could also sit in the middle of every pool and look um, around you at a gallery of all of the different feelings and ideas that had been inscribed on these pinwheels while you watched them move. Um, so one thing I will say I was also very proud of in this project is the fact that we did um, allow one of them to be accessible to um, people who are differently able who would have to come there in a wheelchair. And um, one of my favorite moments was actually seeing somebody do that and really enjoy it. Um, so this is a view from the air, so you can see this was about two and a half acres. So it take, 
7,000 pinwheels um, precisely mapped at different heights. Uh, I think we had four different heights. And um, we also, um, you know, again, this was a project that didn't have much of a budget at all. So we took existing chairs that had been given to uh, the park, um, Adirondack chairs, painted them yellow. Um, there was another place where I took a tree trunk and uh, that was lying around and we cut it and made it yellow. And actually for opening day, I have to say one of the most beautiful things that happened was that it rained. And uh, my dream of filling these pools and reflecting all of these, these ideas and these views and these prayers for the park um, became a reality for a, a short bit of time. Um, so I believe, yeah, you can see it. So this is what they would do. So what it did while you experienced it was also telegraph the spirit of the space as it moved through the park. Um, and uh, this was at the time when we were, I believe, either coming out of the last election. Um, so it was very, very beautiful and interesting to see people's ideas um, written on these pinwheels. Um, because it was a park, we also had to look at um, materials that could withstand weather but be completely biodegradable and we couldn't go into the ground or touch the trees or attach to anything. So we had to come up with a system that could be self-supporting and uh, minimal and um, also removable. So at the end of the project, actually one of the nicest thing was that the organizers um, allowed people to come and take them. And uh, every single one of these got taken and spread around to the five boroughs. And I still get photographs of them uh, installed in various uh, places. So, um, and I guess this message of love wins um, is still a winner for me. Um, here are some other views as you can see them from different sides of it. So the idea really was that when you came onto this space which you entered from kind of high ground, you would look down and this is what you would see. It would be kind of a sea of yellow in front of you that was undulating um, with the ideas and feelings of the people for whom this park was very dear. Um, lots of things happened here, lots of engagement, lots of um, uh, <laughs> uh, things that inspire you, which I think is one of those those beautiful privileges of being being an architect, being a designer, um, of doing things in the public realm and seeing what people do with it. Um, everything from dancing to uh, painting to uh, getting married to um, everything else that you could imagine, which was absolutely wonderful uh, and really, really gratifying, actually, to see this project come to life. Um, and uh, the next, and I believe this is the last project since I'm at um, 5.45, is uh, the sculpture that was in Times Square that um, Julio was mentioning to begin with. Um, we uh, were asked to design, um, or we won a competition, I should say, um, to design a sculpture uh, in Times Square um, during February uh, about love and the theme is about love and it's about different kinds of love and uh, the idea or the brief of this was um, to have um, express architectonically the idea that justice expressed in community um, feel uh, justice is the expression of love in community and tenderness is its expression in private. And I was very uh, inspired by this and wanted to create something that would actually stand up to, um, to all of the competing visual elements of Times Square. Uh, so, and I also wanted to generate a space. Um, so what I did is generate an X shape, which when you intersect it at its crossing with a circle actually creates a heart that you see from below. So this was also um, an interactive sculpture when you stepped in it. Um, the lights glowed brighter also to illustrate the power of community and the power of love. And it's about 20 feet tall, it weighed about 16 tons. Um, it could not, it had to again be self-supporting because it, uh, we couldn't actually, you know, there's no foundation of any kind that you could use. So it had to be very, very heavy to be able to withstand um, 100 mile an hour winds and anything else that the public might want to throw at it, which is always, uh, an interesting journey when you're in a public space like this. Um, so when you're in the middle of the sculpture, this is what you see. And um, I had inscribed into it the phrase into difference, add equality and find love. 
because I also really strongly believe that architecture is not just a container for culture, it generates culture. And as such, we need to take very seriously the opportunities that we have or that are presented to us um, to really bring a message out if that is something that we feel um, can make a difference in the world. So um, again, in a time of where I feel certainly as an immigrant and as a woman of color operating in this country, um, the obstacles and uh, the difficulties that, that, that one might find on one's journey, I felt it was very important to emphasize this idea of love and justice and equality. Um, which really attracted me to this project. Um, so here are some views of it reflecting um, by day and by night uh, the varying colors of Times Square. Um, it, uh, the structure is actually an aluminum, which allows it over a steel subframe. So it really allows um, all kinds of amazing reflections um, from the colors around it. So we were very, very happy with the way that it turned out. And I will say one thing, it's one thing to be an architect and come up with these ideas. It's another thing to have a very dedicated team of builders who actually built this um, in the coldest of cold weather that we had seen in over a decade in New York. So um, they remain my heroes for a very, very long time to come. Um, so I'll leave you with um, a small film made about making this sculpture in which uh, I really was trying to explore some of my history, my, my way of uh, coming to the places that I've come to uh, through the realm of work. Um, so I will hope you enjoy it. It's not, doesn't take that long. I believe it's less than five minutes long, and then that should bring me to about 45 minutes, which should be just about right. I think it should start in a second. Sorry, yes. Let's see that again. Ah. The grief for the project was this quote from Dr. Cornell West, which talks about justice and love, both in a private and a public context. These issues certainly have been up close and front and center to people like me of color and immigrants, and people who don't have the same opportunities that other people have. And so how do you actually translate that? into a way in which you can bring that idea across to people and make it something interesting and exciting to engage in. I grew up in the city of Madras in South India, which is now called Chennai. When I first came to this country, my first experience with racism was a shock. I didn't even recognize it. I didn't regret it at all, but the first firm that I got an internship in was an all black firm. They were willing to hire me. And then when my second internship was in a white firm that was mostly male, I remember sitting there and thinking, why am I not getting anything interesting to do? And then I look around and I see that the white guys were my age who I could tell were not as interested in the work as I was, were getting the projects and I wasn't. That was my first epiphany of racism. When you recognize the limitations, I mean, this is why I think, you know, being an architect is such an amazing thing, because in essence, what we are doing is always dealing with limitations. We're always dealing with limitations. We're always dealing with the difficulties, with the challenges. That actually is the material that we work with. In my architecture, I always like to go back to stripping things down to the basics, to really understanding how little can you use to say how much. And so when I saw the brief, I was incredibly excited about it. 
New York to me was the first time I had actually felt at home in this country that I was desperately trying to call my own. And the site being this melting point, being these crossroads, the brief being about love, we came across these two different planes and what happens when you cross them and then when you insert a symbol like a circle or an ellipse that implied this heart-shaped icon. It's the magic of geometry where you do these things and then they reveal themselves. We really wanted to create not just a moment or an object that's viewed from all sides, but something that was a space that could be experienced. I felt like we had arrived at an economy of material and shape and form to express this concept. At the intersection of difference and division, when you insert justice, equality, and democracy, love is created. And so it really was this idea of into difference, add equality, find love. That became the formula and the principle for the sculpture. On the one hand, it's this very tall X that you know is a big enough shape that stands out within this urban space. But at the same time, the bottom half of it is the size of a TV, you know, it's a tent. It allows you to feel intimate within that space. So people got married under this. They kissed under it. They created dances under this thing. There were so many things that happened and part of the beauty of doing something that you unleash into the public space is really see how other people interpret what you do form and the experience of architecture and art has the ability to shape a person not just emotionally and culturally but also from their physical well-being in my culture we have a concept called advaita which means you are always part of a whole you don't have the sense of difference to somebody who might have a different opinion than you, a different orientation than you, a different color than you, a different language than you. And as architects, it's the biggest privilege in the world to generate spaces that can actually inspire people to want to be more of themselves. Oops, so I'm gonna leave you with um, a still from another film that I really love, um, which is called La Grande Bellezza by um, Paolo Sorrentino. And uh, this is, a, I believe it's, it's a Japanese tourist who is overcome with the beauty of Rome and, and he dies. Um, and not that I think that people should die from beauty, but it is the power of beauty and the power of the things that we get to do. Um, that this image really symbolizes to me. And so I thought I would leave you there with this. So I'm gonna stop sharing now, if that's okay with everyone. Thank you, Suchi, thank you very much for your lecture. You can hear our applause, but I'll do that. Um, so I'll uh, let um, Douglas to take over, please. And uh, let's uh, follow with the question and answers. Yeah, so wonderful boy, uh, to die from beauty. I suppose if you have to go, that's the way you want to go. Um, um, yeah, you know, I want to remind the students to please um, uh, type in your questions. I'm going to take the, the questioner's prerogative in this case because I just really want to ask you this question. Um, you know, form follows feeling. Obviously, an interesting counterpoint to Louis Sullivan's form follows function. And I would love, you make me want to ask Louis Sullivan, what is the role of feeling in his work? Um, but I can't do that. But I can ask you, what is the role of function in your work? And is it related to what you said in your video about as architects, we're always working with constraints or, um, yeah. 
Um, well, I think, you know, as uh, it, it is one of the things I enjoy so much about being an architect is that we start with function, you know, it gives us that place to, to go from um, what we make has to be practical, it has to work, it has to um, fulfill its the, the needs of the people who um, have, you know, uh, entrusted us with their time and their money in order to give them something that they need. Um, so the, I think actually the first time I realized I had a skill that uh, was actually useful to people um, was kind of an amazing moment uh, for me. So I would say function plays a very, very important role in my work, but what I have realized um, through the years, and certainly this is, it's, it's, it's part of an epiphany that happened to me in my, in my childhood. I, I grew up in a house um, that was designed by an architect, which in those days in India was, was quite a rarity. My father happened to have a, a friend who was a, an autodidact who was really into Japanese architecture and had like the only house in the entire town that had a whole bonsai landscape in front of it. And um, he, we had the privilege of really having him make our home and I remember at the age of about 10, I think, really somehow knowing that my house was this protagonist in my life, that it made me a different person than my friends. Not a better person really, but a, just a different person. And I knew that it acted on me in this kind of way. And the clarity and the truth of that epiphany is the thing that has driven me to become an architect, to really explore the kinds of things um, that I try to explore through my work, which is really, how does it make you feel? Because yes, it has to work. Yes, it has to stand up. Yes, it has to protect you from the elements. Yes, it has to, you know, um, express certain things um, perhaps about innovation or technology or technique um, in the way in which you do it. But I think mostly it needs to make you feel your best. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, um, that, that function is um, necessary, but not sufficient. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. So who, Julio had typed in a question, and I see the, some more questions coming in here. Um, in um, in the Google project, um, did you have a scientific hypothesis of how the different rooms would be perceived, Miro, aesthetically speaking? And did you find agreement with uh, those hypotheses and the results? Or what, were there surprises? What did you learn? Well, the, the point of it actually was to discover some surprises. Like it would have been rather a boring project had we, you know, had everybody just come out of it going, oh, well, I, I knew it, but I like that, you know, um, what's, the, what's the big deal? Um, so, but uh, to answer your question about a scientific hypothesis, yes, we did work with um, the Arts and Mind Lab at Hopkins at the Brain Sciences Institute and with whom we had created a grid of um, possible definers of, of different states that we would want to create. And then we wanted to see if um, we could get both anecdotal and um, scientific evidence that could actually hold up in this um, through both of these lenses. And I will say it was a very, very interesting um, project uh, because I'm very humbling to tell you the truth um, because A, since we weren't allowed to keep anyone's data, um, I was literally sitting outside doing an exit poll of everyone that came in and left, um, really asking them what their, um, what their um, feelings were about it. And a lot of them told me that it wasn't what they expected. Um, they had felt at home in a certain space. It was almost um, uh, across the board that everyone loved the very first room, which was kind of, you know, based on a cave and was very earthy and comforting, that most people really liked it and thought it would be their, the place their bodies were the most at ease in, but were very surprised to find that perhaps it was in other ones. And, you know, all kinds of questions came up as to, you know, socio political questions of, of people who, um, there was a journalist who comes from Latin America uh, from, and, you know, being from a third world, quote unquote, country myself, um, I could understand what she was saying that she felt, you know, like the things that were at play for her was like whether she deserved to be in a certain space or whether it was up to, uh, whether she was up to it or the space was up to her, you know, there's all of these actors on how we experience space. It's never, it's one of the most complex equations, I think, that we can ever, ever try to unravel. So I won't pretend to have the answers. We were really trying to look at it through um, 
the lenses that we had at hand. Um, I know that, you know, this is something that I would like to continue doing for the rest of my career to really see what other factors and formats we would be able to dig into um, to really be able to hypothesize and, and quote unquote prove something. Um, but I'm not so sure that we'll be there anytime soon. What we did prove was that your body reacts to space and perhaps differently than you think, than your mind does. And, you know, what does that do and what does that mean in terms of how we make our homes and our cities and our worlds? And what do we do with that knowledge? And actually one of the most uh, beautiful things uh, was uh, a couple who are friends of mine both came out to see me after after they went through the whole thing and they both looked at their their readouts and they both had flares in the same place in this room and they said oh that was that moment we both smiled at each other because we liked this pop-up book so much and you know this is a, it's the beauty of connection and it's the beauty of what happens to us as humans that isn't so intangible you know, it really is a tangible force. And I think the more we as architects really learn to recognize that these things exist, the more that becomes a material that we work and play with. I love that, right? Uh, really good friends start to complete each other's sentences and they even have the same readout on your Google uh, space. Um, yeah, we, we, are, um, we are placing, the you say you don't have all the answers. Yes, we, we are assuming, we are insisting that you give us all the answers. Um, one of the questions that we have, um, and this is a question from our dean, is how do the figurative associations influence the effects of, our, of spatial qualities? Texture, light, color, how, how do those affect our feelings? Um, what are the qualities of space that encourage people to be more themselves? Um, is there, can you, if, if you, if you want to make a space, if you were, if we were asking you to make a space to make people r relax and be themselves, what textures, lights, and colors and abstractions would you use? Well, you know, um, the, it's a, it's a really great question. Um, it would depend on who you are, right? So, um, uh, Generally speaking, when I'm doing it for a client and I get to be specific with them, I try to understand the things that they respond to um, and then correlate it to um, a lot of research that really is out there that has been done both in the fields of neuroscience and psychology of people with relationships to shapes, um, to the importance of proprioception, to the ideas of textures, which kinds of things have been known within controlled studies um, to yield certain kinds of results which, you know, science is always trying to have a universal answer. And I think as architects, that's somehow not, or I don't think that's my place as an architect to have a universal answer. What I do want to have is a very specific answer, a very personal answer to the problem. So in a sense, this project that I showed you, the challenge of that was that I had to uh, sort of intuit for a large group for whom I, you know, wasn't designed for one specific person. It was designed for the populace at large to kind of see what would happen. So I projected what I thought might work and measured that against the grid of, of attributes that I was asked to design to and got to, to ask the question, did it work or didn't it work? And I would say that it did for you know um, a large number of people that I spoke to, but since you know I wasn't allowed to tabulate anything, I couldn't tell you for sure. Um, but certainly, I do think that designing spaces where people feel their best is very important. And honestly, I don't think I'm revolutionary in this. I think every good architect does this. It's really a question of where you begin from. And for me, this is as much a reaction to my own architectural education, to what was happening when I graduated, um, to as a sort of rebellion against um, a uh, technological approach towards architecture that innovation and technology isn't necessarily what drives great architecture. It can be, but it isn't solely by itself. And for me, it's very important that the place that you define very clearly for yourself, who you are, what matters to you, and what is it that you want to bring into the world. And so it's the place where I come from that I think makes the difference. And that's why I always refocus it as a priority. And when I'm teaching with my students, you know, this is what, for them to come into a studio with me and say, okay, let's design from a point of feeling, you know, um, 
it was a I I was surprised at how revolutionary that was to them that it, they they hadn't been asked to do that, and for me this is just the way I operated, you know. Um, so it was actually a really uh, fun and great experience, um, and I think they loved it. So yeah, fascinating. I mean, we yeah, I, that, I think you're absolutely right that um, what you are doing self-consciously or, or self-aware is something that all architects do, but you, 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 have, you, have the, you, you have shined that light on that part of it. Mark had a follow-up question, which is perfect to, uh, of what you were saying is, what about um, common cultural associations? You were talking about the, you can only act from your personal assumptions of what the textures and stuff, but, but there, are, there are universal, um, um, there are universals in architecture, right? Whether it's as simple as what is heavy and what is light, what is seemingly fragile and what is seemingly strong, in, in, in much more specific cultural shared language. How does that influence um, w w the, the work that you do? Well, you know, I, I guess, again, I have a very specific kind of viewpoint on this, which is uh, the fact that I come from uh, from India. My my culture is something I'm, I'm very proud of. And it's quite different uh, from the culture that I call my own now here. And I uh, relish actually that place. I relish the place of being an immigrant. I relish the perspective that I have that allows me to see things from this liminal perspective that lets me see and feel how do we act in different places in different ways. Um, it is a very, very humbling thing, I think, when we do architecture, but I think it's a question that certainly we need to pay attention to because there are systemic biases that I think we propagate through architecture that I think need to be looked at very, very carefully in the realm, in the through the lens of, of, of culture, through the lens of um, language, through the lens of uh, your ease and your access to things. And this is why, you know, this is becoming slowly actually something that I really would love to focus uh, a lot on as I go forth. And some of the work that we're doing as we, um, that's gonna come out next year, which I can't really talk about right now, sadly, is it does have to do with, um, with access, with communication, um, with the agency of community as a whole. Um, which I really would like to focus on more in the work. You, 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 it sounds like you have a fascinating practice and um, some of our um, professor practitioners, um, Milton Schinberg, would love if you would um, describe your office and how people collaborate and how you create the opportunity for positive interaction within your office. What is, what is the culture that you create? Well, I'm actually sitting in our conference room, sadly, by myself right now. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, the, the normal practice is that uh, we're, we're a firm of 16 people. Um, and typically speaking, when we start with a project, um, anyone uh, who's on the project gets to sit in on the design um, exercise uh, so that we're all actually engaging with it, whether it's the intern or it's me. And generally speaking, the, we'll, we'll just say the best idea wins. And sometimes, even if that might be lost time, I find that to be very, very, very important uh, period in a project, because what it does do is make everyone feel like they were really a part of this thing. And I couldn't be presenting all of this work without the dedication of the people who work with me. So that's something that, you know, is really, really important to me. I usually actually start my lectures with a picture of my studio and um, thanking them before I thank the people who invite me. But um, I didn't do it today because for nine months, you know, it's been very hard to see them. Uh, we meet each other on construction sites and for short meetings and uh, they have valiantly figured out how to work digitally and remotely and continue to do the work that we're doing, um, which is really amazing because literally now my team is spread across the globe. Um, and we're working from different time zones and uh, all kinds of overcoming all kinds of obstacles. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's very important to me that the culture and the ethos in the firm is one of passion and of dedication and um, really the, the not forgetting the desire to do better and to do good, which I think is really important for us as architects to keep in mind. 
Yeah, and it, I mean, there's a there's a number of questions about about you know the the elephant in the room or the many squares on our screens. Um, you you mentioned um, you know that music is a space between notes, and by extension, architecture is a space between walls, and that place matters. Um, we have all recently experienced how much place matters, and the challenge of of being um, being creative and working and being a work mindset in our basements or bedrooms. Um, how have you in, in your office overcome those challenges? Um, well, I think they've all done pretty well. It's just been really, really hard, especially in the beginning. I think it was really hard, like it was for everyone else, for the people who have children. Um, it was very uh, a, a difficult thing. I think the the members of my my firm who live by themselves and are are able to function whether it's with roommates or not was uh, sort of easier than I would say for for those people. But you know the qualities of of space. I'm lucky enough that I live within walking distance to my studio, so I walk over here um, regardless, and and I can be here, and they're welcome to be here whenever they want to, as whenever they feel you know it's safe and they're comfortable um, with doing that. But I think people have. It took us a good, I would say, three months to get into sort of accepting that this is this is maybe the way to go forward, and I don't think it's necessarily all bad. You know, there, it has certainly shown us that there are ways to operate, that there are ways to do things um, that we hadn't thought of before, um, that certainly uh, we hadn't accepted, shall we say. So um, I was actually very, we did a, one of the first things we did as um, we shut down the office and went remote was a, as a competition for a pavilion in Canada. And I really wondered if we would be able to pull that off, if we'd be able to, to do that and work on something creative when we hadn't worked on it before. Some of the other projects had been in the mix, so everyone knew everybody, you know, we didn't hire anyone new, they all knew each other, they had working relationships with each other. Um, but we managed and um, we actually just posted it on Instagram, I too, uh, think, um, also. And I was very proud of it. I thought they, we did a very good job considering that we didn't have the opportunity to be in the same space while we did it. So while I do believe in the importance of, of uh, personal communication and being there in the same room with each other, uh, I think there are ways in which we could do that, but we could also see it as a way of expanding. You know, We could really work with anyone anywhere in the world now. We know how to do this. Um, so that just expands the field of creativity as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, things will never be the same. Absolutely. No. Yeah, and, and, and that's a perfect segue. I think um, we are uh, continuing to try to expand our way of, of collaborating and being with um, being together while being separate. Um, as, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, and as Julio said to everybody, this is this is your reminder, the, the AIS has created a virtual Miller space. Um, if we were in the auditorium, this would be at the point in the evening that we would all uh, invite you to to join us in the Miller space and we would have uh, individual conversations. If you go to the um, mural board link that Julio posted, um, you will see a a virtual Miller space with a series of links. You You merely need to click on one of those Zoom links and you will pop into a different space with people and have a um, a, a smaller uh, gathering and conversation. Um, be, because the technology doesn't work the way we really would love it to, that your avatar would remain in that Miller space and you could say, oh, um, there, there's uh, Lavinia, I wanna go talk to her and walk over. You have to leave your name or your face, if you'd like, uh, in, the, in the mural board, which room you go into. And then when you um, pop back out, you can see where Travis is or where Milton is, or where Maria is, and we can go over there and have a, have a, have a glass of wine together. Um, so I, uh, Sushi, I, I, uh, Suchi, I really want to um, thank you for all, from all of us for, for shining a light on a piece of architecture that I guess we all know is there, but in the rush of all the things we're doing, maybe we don't always uh, give it the, the due focus. It, 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 uh, I personally find you actually really inspiring and, um, and just want to thank you for sharing that with us. Well, thank you so much. I really, thank really appreciate you. being here.
I'm, I'm really honored to be able to share the work. So thank you.